Okay, I'm going to officially get the show on the road. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Open Textbook Network Summit. Thank you for joining us for today's session. It is called OER and Fair Use, Strange Bedfellows or BFFs. This session is with Carla Myers, Will Cross, and Sunny Pai. My name is Karen Lauritsen. I'm publishing director at the Open Textbook Network, soon to be the Open Education Network. If you're not familiar with us, we are a community of higher education organizations working together to make education more equitable, accessible, and affordable through open education. You can learn more about us at open.umn.edu slash OTN. I'm serving as facilitator for today's session. I'm joined by our OTN team, including Sarah Cohen, Senior Managing Director, who will be managing the Q&A with me. Before we really get started, I'd like to share a couple of details with you. First, we are live tweeting our sessions, so please join us on Twitter at open underscore textbooks. The hashtag we're using is OTN Summit 20. This session is being recorded. The video and transcripts will be posted on our YouTube channel after the summit has concluded. And today our panelists are going to be taking questions during the presentation, so please submit your questions as they come to you using the Q&A feature in Zoom. You do have the option to make your questions anonymous. And we may not be able to get to all of the questions during the presentation. Sometimes it can be a little fast and furious, but we'll do our best to cover as much as possible. Please know we're committed to providing a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for all attendees. And we invite you to join us in creating a safe and constructive space. You can learn more about our community norms at z.umn.edu slash summit community norms. Now, please join me in welcoming our three presenters. Carla Meyer serves as assistant professor and coordinator of scholarly communications for the Miami University Libraries. Her professional presentations and publications focus on library and educational copyright issues, as well as open educational resource creation and use. Will Cross is the director of the Copyright and Digital Scholarship Center at NC State University Libraries. Trained as a lawyer and librarian, he guides policy, speaks, and writes on open culture and navigating legal uncertainty. Sunny Pai is the Digital Initiatives Librarian at Kapolani Community College in Hawaii. She develops online collections in DSpace for her college and supports OER and textbook cost zero at her college and the University of Hawaii system. Today, our three guests are going to explore issues around OER and fair use. And with that, I will turn things over to Carla. Carla, you're still muted. Okay, can everybody hear me and see my screen now? Yes. Awesome, awesome, wonderful. Um, so thank you so much everybody for joining us today. This is a very fun topic, which I think we are all excited to talk about. Um, thanks Karen for the introduction. Uh, Will or Sunny, do you wanna say any other words before we dive in? No, I'll just echo, echo the thank you. I'm really excited to be part of this discussion. Thank you. And getting started, I think, Will, you're going to kick us off, right? Absolutely, yeah. So, so thank you all for, for having us here. Um, and we can actually go ahead and go to the next slide now. So I, I want to say I hope a lot of people that are in this session got to see Carla's excellent session on Tuesday as well. I think she did a great job of laying a foundation for a lot of these issues. Um, and we'll, we'll make sure we have a shared vocabulary and everything, but also build on the good discussion she had. Um, so, so the topic today is the relationship between fair use and open education. Um, and so, so I'm going to sort of set the stage with some basics about the what, why, and how of fair use. Uh, you may know that fair use is this sort of safety valve for free expression that's built into copyright law. Um, it starts out as judge-made law, and then it's codified in the 76 Act 
And it exists in the context of this whole suite of sort of specific exceptions where Congress said, uh, this set of people doing this set of things, if we strictly enforced copyright and made you get permission, it would get in the way of the larger purpose of copyright. So uh, instructors doing face-to-face -face teaching, don't worry about copyright for your teaching stuff, just, just do it, don't worry about it. Um, and so Congress has these carve outs for instructors, for libraries, for a lot of sort of socially valuable and often non-commercial actors. And fair use exists in that context as sort of the exceptional exception. It was Congress's way of saying and recognizing that the courts had been saying for a couple hundred years, there are huge sets of people that we're not thinking of when we write the copyright law, doing things we couldn't possibly anticipate. And so we're gonna build fair use in as the safety valve as a sort of an extra special exception for those things that we might not have anticipated or done. And over the past 40 years or so, fair use has sort of grown and grown in importance as the law has gotten creaky in places, or as we've increasingly recognized that the people who were in Congress in the 70s didn't necessarily recognize the, the large swaths of creativity that happened in the world that they might not have set aside an exception for. Um, so that's sort of the what fair use is. The other thing to say about it is it's, it is a positive right. Um, a theme that Carla sounded on Tuesday that I want to sort of resound here is that copyright is all about balance, right? That it's, it's a short term set of controls that we give to rights holders balanced with a set of uh, rights that users have to engage with culture in different ways. So using fair use isn't like a sneaky thing you might get away with. It's not a defense that you can kind of technically use if you know the law well enough. It's a co-equal part of the copyright system, along with the sort of bundle of rights that we talk about that rights holders have. So, so it's this really powerful safety valve, um, and it's exceptional in some ways we're going to talk about in a minute. Next slide, please. So that's sort of the what. Let's talk about the how a little bit. Uh, if you've ever seen a fair use presentation before, you've probably seen these four factors and maybe a set of scales as well. Uh, because fair use is designed to be flexible, uh, it's not a sort of checklist where if you do this and this and this, you do get the exception. And if you don't check all those boxes, you don't. Instead, it's squishier in a lot of different ways. And that's where the scales come in. People often talk about sort of these four factors as stones that tilt the fair use analysis in one direction or the other. Uh, the analogy I got in law school is actually that, that doing fair use is like making soup. And these are sort of four ingredients that you pour into the pot and if there was ever a lawsuit, what a judge would do basically is they like take a big wooden spoon and dip it in and taste it and go like, mm, that's good fair use or Ugh, that fair use smells bad. It's that scientific, it's that precise, right? It's designed to be flexible. And so necessarily it, there's some squishiness in there. Um, so, so the starting place for making that soup is these four factors. Although the statute is clear to say these are four things to consider not the only things to consider and not four sort of co-equal factors to consider as well. Um, so so the, four, the four sort of questions to ask yourself or things that you pour into the fair use suit are, what are you doing, the purpose and character of your use? Uh, what are you using, the nature of the original work? How much are you using, the amount and substantiality? And then the effect on the market, is your work a substitute or not? So the quest questions like, are you doing something that serves the ultimate aims of copyright by moving the progress of science and knowledge forward, or are you just trying to get rich? That's your first factor. What are you doing? Uh, the second factor, are you using something that's widely available or closely held, or something that's more factual or more creative? Are you using something that copyright especially protects or where it's sort of already out there in the world? Um, the third factor is often sort of the pivot point for the analysis. And I want to suggest that when you think about fair use, the word substantiality is really the key there. When you make a copyright a fair use claim, your argument is, I need to do this socially valuable thing and I shouldn't have to get permission. That's my purpose. The third factor says, okay, to do that socially valuable thing, how much of somebody else's work do you need to borrow? If you're writing a book review, maybe just a couple sentences saying, gosh, this prose is deadly dull. Look at these sentences that's the appropriate amount. But if you're doing art critique, another favored purpose, you might need the whole work, but maybe not a high resolution version of it. So what are you doing? What are you using? And then the third factor is really, are you using the right amount? It's sort of the third bowl of porridge, if we call this the Goldilocks rule. And then the fourth factor is your work a substitute. Are you just free riding off somebody else's stuff? Mm -hmm. Or are you doing something that, that changes it, that brings your own voice to bear or your own sort of a way of understanding things. So that's that's the fair use soup as we often introduce it, these four statutory factors. 
Let's do sort of a silly example and then a more serious example. Carla, if we could go to the next slide. So this is, this is one of my favorite examples. This is Garfield minus Garfield. Um, you can see what, what the person has done is they took the original Garfield strip and they removed Garfield, right? Uh, to sort of tell a joke about what it would mean for John Arbuckle to actually be wandering around talking to himself in his sort of suburban ennui. Uh, there is no Garfield minus Garfield exception in the Copyright Act, so we, we kick to fair use. Um, and if you think through those four factors, the purpose and character of the use is sort of talking back to or commenting on Garfield. Garfield says this, here's a different way of thinking about it. Here's a different way of understanding it. Uh, it was on the web, so it's non-commercial. Soup is tasting pretty good so far. The second factor, the nature of the original work, the what, uh, again, it's widely available, but it's creative, so it kind of goes out in the wash. Uh, courts don't spend a lot of time usually talking about the second factor, and it probably wouldn't weigh very heavily one side or the other here. So soup is still smelling and tasting pretty good. Uh, how much? The, the amount that they used here, it's, it's in the title, right? It's Garfield minus Garfield. They used the whole thing except for the Garfield part of it. Um, that we could talk about as a lot or a little, but it's probably better to talk about it in terms of they use the appropriate amount, right? The joke here is it's Garfield minus Garfield. So the appropriate amount is the Garfield strip minus the Garfield character. So I'd, I'd say that's a pretty good factor three analysis. They use the appropriate amount. Soup tastes real good. And then a substitute for the original, right? Would anybody who loves the Garfield comics see Garfield minus Garfield and say, oh, well, I don't need the original Garfield. Of course not, right? If anything, it makes you go, oh yeah, that Garfield strip, I love that, I'll check it out, right? Um, it's a different thing. So th that's the way you would think through those four factors for what I think is pretty clearly fair use. The fifth factor I would add here is the sort of who cares or who would be angry factor. Uh, and that speaks to the sort of risk analysis that fair use always asks us to do. Uh, and so in this case, the, the question who cares, the answer is maybe Jim Davis cares, right? So, so is he likely to find out? Does he care in that sense? And is he likely to be happy or mad? And the good news with the Garfield example, if we can go to the next slide, is we know the answer to that question. Jim Davis did find out, and he did the most Jim Davis thing possible. Uh, they created a licensing agreement, and they started selling books together, right? He found a way to commercialize Garfield minus Garfield, and it became available. Um, I like this example because it demonstrates what fair use is really about, right? So there was, a, there was Garfield, and it was awesome and creative. Copyright was doing its job. Somebody made Garfield minus Garfield uh, without permission so they could put their thing into the world and start a conversation, fair use doing its job. And the result of that is the creators have come together and this whole conversation has continued beyond those two folks. If you go online, you can find Garfield plus President James Garfield. You can find Garfield minus Sanity where Garfield is replaced with an actual cat who just sort of looks quizzically at John, et cetera, right? So fair use as facilitating uh, engaging with existing culture in a way that talks back to it or brings a new perspective to it. Uh, that's one way to think about what fair use is for, is this sort of ongoing, on the shoulders of giants conversation. So that's sort of a silly example that hopefully walks through the four factors. Very quickly, I wanna do a, maybe a more serious example on the next slide. Um, so this spring, as, as we were all trying to figure out online teaching during COVID, a large group of us, including Carla and I, came together um, to, to put out this statement, how to think about fair use in terms of sudden exigent distance education, right? Would it have been fair use to scan a whole book in, you know, in another time? Maybe not, but in the context of a public health emergency, uh, it starts to feel different. Uh, if you're interested in sort of the, the way we walked through those factors and the who cares piece, you can go to the document. I've got it linked down there in the tiny URL, but I wanted to point to it as, as sort of a more serious example of when fair use looms very large because there's this public health crisis, right? Something needs to happen to keep education moving forward, to protect public health. And so we need to understand uh, fair use in that context. So, so that's the what, why, how much, and a substitute. That's the four factors. A funny thing happened in 1994, though, and, and Carla, if you'll take us to the next slide. In 1994, the Supreme Court, considering a, a fairly rude parody of a beloved oldies song done by, by the sort of hip hop group that often doesn't get a lot of respect from the courts, um, synthesized those four factors. And they said, what we're talking about here, the sort of on the shoulders of giants adding creativity thing can really be best understood in terms of this transformation question, these two core questions, whether the new work merely supersedes, are you just free riding off somebody else's creativity? Or are you adding something new with new expression, meaning, or message? 
In other words, can I hear your voice and your creativity in this? Are you adding something to the conversation, bringing something to the table, or are you just sort of repurposing something somebody else did without engaging in it in a thoughtful way? And then if you are doing that, are you using the appropriate amount? So you can see the third factor is over there in the reasonable in relation to the purpose. The first factor sort of exists in the transformative question uh, and then courts have said that if something is transformative, it de facto exists in a different marketplace, so there is not market substitution. So that's the way those sort of four factors are synthesized into these two core questions. So let's do again kind of a, a lighter example and then a more serious example as well. So on the next slide, this is kind of the fine art version of Garfield minus Garfield. Um, folks took some famous paintings, uh, Nighthawks, and then I always call it Sunday in the Park with George because I'm a Sondheim person. It has a French title that's not that. But, but these two famous paintings, and they removed all the people from, them, right? So this is fine art minus humanity or minus people gathering in some sense. Um, this is, a, a, I think, sort of a textbook transformative use, right? The Nighthawks painting is protected by copyright. I don't think the person who made this got permission, but they're using it for a new purpose. They're not trying to do the artistic stuff that Nighthawks was doing. They're trying to make a point about social distancing, right? So it's an, an artist talking back to an artist and using the work in a new and different way. And again, using the appropriate amount to make their point. Um, so that to me looks like a pretty clear example of a transformative use. On the next slide, we have one that's maybe a little closer to home in terms of publishing. Um, if you have ever worked with scholars, you have had this problem that there are certain artists and estates that are just wildly litigious that even though the fair use argument is ironclad and totally right, there's still gonna be a lawsuit at the end of that conversation. And so how you deal with that uh, varies from, from creator to creator. Um, this this uh, scholar here talks about the fact that Picasso and the Picasso estate had been one of those sort of troublesome estates. And there had been very few illustrated books about Picasso, except as you can see by wealthy individuals or museums in a particular context. Um, she relied on fair use and this set of best practices that we're going to talk about a little more in a bit. Um, did this work? Not only has it been successful, not only did they not get sued into oblivion because they could rely on fair use in a way that was quantifiable, she just won this major prize that came with a $10,000 check. So, so this is fair use sort of supporting publishing in a way that clearly equalizes access, opens up culture, and, and has been done at a high level in a really successful way. So that's the transformative use stuff. And when you think about fair use, I would suggest you, you think about those four questions, but sort of the life of fair use, the heart of fair use exists in this transformative question. Does your creativity or your voice shine through and are you using the appropriate amount? And then on the next slide, um, this has been the dominant way of thinking about fair use for the past quarter century or so. And although it remains flexible and fact specific in the sort of suit making way that we talked about, it has been incredibly consistent. Uh, this is this little chart I have over here is from a 2012 article. The fair use victories have only continued to pile up since then and those the level of certainty has gone up since then. But you can see when, when your use is transformative um, and when, when you're an actual person doing that kind of stuff, you win your fair use cases 80 some percent of the time or so in 2012, I'd say it's closer to 90% of the time now. And that's when there's actually been a lawsuit. That's not even the overwhelming majority of cases where the fair use is clear and there isn't a lawsuit. So fair use is, is flexible in those important ways, but it's if anybody says it's uncertain or scary or you don't know, I would say to them, well, if you're thinking about it in this way, the data suggests it's not quite so scary as people might suggest. Um, the other thing, and the last thing I'll add to that before I turn it over to Carla is, even if there is a lawsuit and even if you lose, by design, fair use is backstopped by a set of protections around good faith use. Um, so if I ever get a tattoo, it's gonna be, it's gonna say 504C2. That's the section in the Copyright Act that says, if you work at a nonprofit educational institution and you have a good faith belief that your use was fair, even if you're wrong, even if there's a threat that leads to a lawsuit, that leads to a trial that you lose, they still remit the big money, scary, sort of the beginning of the DVD when they have that big scare quotes um, back in the day. The big money damages are, are remitted, are removed in that context. So fair use is reliable and it is backstopped even in the very rare cases where it, things don't go your way. So, so I wanna suggest it's a powerful sort of tool for artistic expression, for teaching and learning, for all the society serving stuff that we do. And it's a lot safer and less scary than people might want you to believe in some cases. So hopefully that's laid a good foundation. Um, I'm happy to take any questions if 
Karen, there are any now, or, or if not, I'm happy to turn it over to Carla and have her talk about the ways fair use intersects with education and publishing. Yeah, Will, we have two questions for you. Uh, as you were talking about Picasso, somebody asked, what about licensing issues separate from copyright? That's a good question. So, so one of the ways to solve a copyright problem is to get a license, right? If, if, if you're the rights holder, I can either say, hi, can I use your thing? And if you say yes, we're done with copyright, you have granted me permission, or I can rely on a copyright exception. Um, what has tended to happen with a lot, um, Picasso is this case, uh, Stephen James Joyce famously was this way as well, is basically they would never license anything. And if they did, they wanted really, really fine grained review to make sure their famous ancestor was not painted in anything but the most wonderful and perfect light. So any scholarship that was anything other than glowing and reverent, uh, a license was not offered. And that's exactly what fair use is for, is fair use is the I want to be critical of you. I want to talk back to you. I want to say something that you might not want to give me permission to say, exception in that context. So, so scholarship needs to happen even if there's not a license. If there is a license, hooray, problem solved. We can have a conversation about the cost of licenses and the scholars and creators we price out of equal participation through a licensing market. But that's a long-winded answer to that really good question. Thank you. And can you please restate the federal legal statute that fair use is listed, as well as name the section the backstop was in? Yes, absolutely. Fair use is in 17 U.S.C. 107, um, and the backstop is section 504, paren C, paren 2. Thank you for those questions. Carla, take it away. Cool. Thanks so much, Will, and uh, I can't wait to see your tattoo. Um, <laughs> So fair use in education and publishing. What does this look like? Um, fair use loves education. And I think we can say this on a variety of levels. First off, within the law itself that Will just gave us, um, Section 107 of Title 17 of the United States Code. And you can see right here the language that is included in it, that the law specifically cites purposes such as criticism and commentary. Very frequently within the scope of education, within the scope of publishing, we are providing criticism and commentary on things. Um, the law cites news reporting, it cites te teaching. Again, another huge example that we're very frequently doing, not just with publishing in general, but with OER um, publishing as well. Um, here it cites multiple copies for classroom use, um, for scholarship, for the creation of new scholarship or research. So we see right within the law itself. Now, a very common misconception we're going to talk about is, oh, my purpose is educational, so it's automatically a fair use. Not quite, but the law itself says that these are favored purposes, or these kind of like Will said, are things that fair use was created for to strike this balance. Maybe especially when providing criticism or commentary in a way that the original creator might not want to hear or not be willing to license. So within the law itself, we see these purposes that align very much with what we're trying to do as part of education or with OER publishing. And then we also see this in the courts, um, courts supporting these educational or transformative uses. So we want to take a look at a few examples. The first one that we have is Bill Graham Archives versus DK uh, with an audience full of librarians and educators. I'm guessing most of us are familiar with DK as a publisher. DK was working together, put to, working to put together this coffee table book that took a look at the history of the Grateful Dead. Um, Bill Graham, he was a very famous uh, conference, excuse me, concert promoter. Um, he had an extensive archives of working with the Grateful Dead. And DK was interested in using some of the Grateful Dead conference posters as part of this book. They wanted to incorporate into a timeline talking about the history of the Grateful Dead. So they started negotiations with the Bill Graham archives um, in regards to a potential license. But in the end, DK wasn't necessarily happy with the license terms and the cost. So they walked away from those negotiations, but they still ended up using the conference posters, excuse me, the concert posters in the book um, as part of that timeline. The Bill Graham archives was not pleased with that and they sued them for copyright infringement. DK cited fair use for the reuse of the concert posters. And working through the four factors of fair use here, 
what the judges thought about is, first off, what was the purpose? And a little bit of DK's purpose was, of course, commercial. They created these books to sell them because that's what they do as a publisher. But what the court said is what we actually see here is a very strong transformative use that these concert posters were originally created to get people excited about the concert, um, to sell tickets, to communicate the dates and other important information about the concert. But here, DK was putting them into a historical context, a timeline with commentary and information that told the tale of the band, the history of their concerts, and the history of them in general. So they said, originally, these were really creative, um, these were intended to drive ticket sales and get people excited for the event, but here what they're being used for is to explain the history of a band. So a very transformative purpose from what they were originally created. Um, now, when it came to the second factor, the nature of the work, you know, there was the argument that these are very, very highly creative artistic works, these posters. But the judges said, when it comes to transformative use, something being really, really created, it's not necessarily going to have as much impact as it would in other contexts. This was one of those situations where the whole entire work needed to be used, which we see very frequently with works of art, with pictures, with graphs, in order to communicate to make this effective within the scope of the timeline. They had to share the whole entire work. They couldn't just use a portion of the concert poster. However, it's a very minimal size within the book. This is a coffee table book. It's a little bit bigger than usual, but the posters are reprinted in a smaller size. And what the judge said, um, judges said was, given that it was reused in a very small size um, and the image quality, the fact that they reused the whole entire work, how they shared that whole entire work, again, had minimal impact and weighed in DK's favor. And then the fourth factor, they said, given the transformative nature of how these posters were used within the book, that there's really no market impact here. Even if there could have been a potential licensing situation, that when we have a transformative use, the potential for market harm is not as strong. So here we did see a commercial publisher reusing whole entire works. Um, their purpose was educational, it was transformative, but in the end, the courts found it to be a fair use because of that transformative nature. So taking a look at another case, um, one that's maybe a little bit closer to home for us, is the Authors Guild v. Hottie Trust. So the Hottie Trust Library came out of the Google Books project. The Hottie Trust Library involves the libraries that were involved in the Google Books project that made their collections available for Google to scan to be included in Google Books, um, their database. And they took these digital copies and they made them into a library that served several purposes. Um, part of it was preservation of the physical copies. Part of it was also allowing um, searches of the books that were within there. And another important part of it too was to allow patrons of those libraries who had uh, disabilities to be able to engage with screen readers or other adaptive technology to allow them to fully engage with those particular works. So when the Authors Guild sued Hottie Trust, Hottie Trust claimed that their digitization of these books was a fair use for a variety of reasons. And in reviewing the four factors of fair use, uh, this decision comes from the appellate courts. What was said is first off their purpose was highly transformative. Um, that again, allowing word searches, allowing people to use these digital copies to search to find specific keywords or passages that were related to the research that they were doing was very transformative from the original intent of these books. They also really highlighted here the access for those with disabilities. Um, as many of us who work in libraries know that the market for accessible copies of published works, it's very, very narrow. And that making all these books available to be used by people who have disabilities, that that was a highly, highly transformative use. And taking a look at the second factor, the nature of the work, we had all kinds of work in works in the Hottie Trust Library, from very scholarly monographs to very creative works of fiction or artworks. 
Um, so they said that there's a variety of works being used here, um, that some are the very creative kind that is more protected by copyright. But again, due to the transformative nature of the Hathi Trust Library, that this factor has a very small impact. Um, of course, that for making these digital copies, they scanned the whole entire works, which the author's field was not pleased with. But the judges saw that here, they did need to scan the whole entire works, not only to facilitate the searching, but also for text-to-speech function for those who have disabilities. And then when it came to the fourth factor, what they really highlighted here is the very, very, very narrow market that is available for accessible copies of resources for people who have disabilities. And here, the fact that people who had disabilities could engage with this library to get fast and easy access to accessible copies of these works, so they found little market harm in that capacity. So once again, we're talking about scanning whole entire works um, and that they're being used for educational purposes um, that are highly transformative. The courts very much found favor for all of that and said that this was a fair use. So another example, which is kind of a fun one, is Warner Brothers Entertainment versus RDR Books, um, or sometimes this is better known as the Harry Potter Lexicon lawsuit. So the Harry Potter Lexicon started off as an online website that was actually created by a librarian. And it was intended to be a resource for people who were reading the Harry Potter books to go look up information. Oh, they're using a spell. What did that spell mean? I know it was originally in book two, but now I'm in book six. I want to look that up real quick. Or I remember that place being mentioned in another book, but I don't necessarily remember the context of that place or that character. We could pop online to the lexicon and look that person or that character up and get a little bit more information about it. Um, something really interesting is J.K. Rowling even talked about using the Harry Potter lexicon online. When she needed to look up or reference something from a previous book, she said it was a lot faster for me to go use a lexicon to look it up. It's such a great resource online than to necessarily flip through all my old books or even more embarrassing, have to go to a bookstore and buy a copy of my own book um, in order to be able to look up that information. So the lexicon was an online reference guide to the Harry Potter world. Um, where things kind of got controversial is when they wanted to take it into a print format. RDR Books approached the um, librarian behind the Harry Potter lexicon and said, let's make a print version of that. And J.K. Rowling, or Warner Brothers, as well as Warner Brothers, who owns many of the rights in these books, had concerns with that. So they sued RDR Books for copyright infringement. RDR said, Your Honor, we believe that this is a fair use. And in working through the four factors, the things that the court considered is, you know, as far as your purpose goes, this is a reference work, which makes it transformative in a capacity. It's a reference work which is intended to supplement and help enrich people's engagement with the Harry Potter novels. Um, so the nature of it being a reference work, that's pretty transformative but then the transformative argument kind of stops there. We don't necessarily see it bleeding into the other three factors as we did with the other two examples that we share here. So they said for the first factor, the purpose, transformative to a point. In terms of the nature of the work, highly, highly creative. Um, J.K. Rowling created this whole new world for us to enjoy. Um, and under copyright law, that type of creativity is very, very protectable and highly favored. So the second factor weighed against RDR books and the Harry Potter lexicon. The third factor was kind of another balancing act. Of course, of course if it's a reference work, if it's almost kind of akin to an encyclopedia of the world, you're going to have to copy a lot of it so you can give people thoughtful and reliable information inside that reference work. So what was said here is, yes, you do have to do some copying within the scope of the lexicon. We recognize that. But we think in some places you copied way too much from the original works. And then the fourth factor was a little bit of a balancing act itself. Um, here the court said that the lexicon is a reference work, which they don't necessarily see as a derivative work. Um, nor is a lexicon likely to substitute 
as um, for people purchasing the original novels. So rather than buying Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, somebody's not likely going to get the same experience by flipping through the lexicon and looking for those references to that particular book. However, when it comes to some of the companion books like Fantastic Beast and Where to Find Them, this lexicon can actually serve as a substitute in that capacity because so much of that was copied in and because of the nature of how these companion works were set up. They said that there could be some substitutes as actual derivatives. So maybe a resource for spells or songs or other things that were included in there. Those could be derivative works. Um, so they said in the end, there's not necessarily substitute, entire substitute um, market here, um, that there is definitely some areas where people are welcome to compete with a lexicon or encyclopedia that J.K. Rowling might want to create herself. And she talked about wanting to do that at some point. Um, but there, that could, there could be some substitution, which could be a little bit dangerous to a potential market for the rights holders of this particular work. But they also expressed here a concern as well. Um, you know, we all know that the purpose of copyright as found in the Constitution is to promote the progress of the useful arts. And one concern that was brought forward here is that if we allow wholesale copying to the extent that maybe it's being done here, there could be a lack of motivation for some rights holders to create things that could fill similar marks. Um, so what's kind of interesting is when this is online, J.K. Rowling was fine and comfortable and even talked about using herself. It's when they moved into a print market where she could start to see a loss of sales or a competition for her own true works that the lawsuit was brought and the courts hesitated to call this fair. So what do we take from all of this? Um, I think it all comes down to making thoughtful applications of the law. And I think one thing that kind of comes from the cases that both Will and I shared is taking a look at when there is pure substitution that we are kind of just replacing the market for the original as versus using it in some transformative way that is providing criticism or commentary or a new look at it. Now, the great thing is it's not too frequent in education that we are just doing pure substitution. Here, students just simply read this and we are done with it. Usually what we are doing is sharing copyrighted works so that we can provide criticism on it, so that we can provide commentary on it, so that we can compare it with other similar works in that genre and then compare and contrast those. So very frequently we are using them in ways that are transformative and not necessarily substitution. I think something to think about here that I've seen come into play with publishing a little bit is are we merely reusing things as um, decoration or enhancement for appeal of the eye as versus enhancement of learning or enhancement of the material or the learning experience. Um, so for example, a conversation I had with a faculty member once was wanting to use, um, it was a cartoon talking about nurses being in um, PPE, personal protective equipment. And it was just a funny joke that they wanted to use, you know, a little, um, uh, one of those just one cell cartoons to make people laugh. And they wanted to use that to, you know, have an entertainment factor as versus pictures of nurses and personal protective equipment to talk about here is what it looks like when you know you are protecting yourselves in different scenario, how you're properly wearing this equipment, what it's to be used for, different equipment in different scenarios. And we talked about the one being a little bit more decorative as versus the reuse of the images that were helping people um, integrate and understand the text that was written about using different types of PPE in a different capacity. So where are we just being decorative as versus enhancing the learning experience? And I think a lot of this work comes into play with what we do in education and especially open educational resources. How are we using third party copyrighted works in a transformative capacity or to enhance the learning experience? And how does that all fit within the context of fair use? Um, so let's take a look at an example of this within the scope of open educational resources. And we're so excited to have Sunny with us to share her experience in working through this. Thank you. <clears throat> um, 
I work at a uh, public, communi uh, public community college and I have been working with the OTM Publishing Cooperative um, all through the steps of uh, developing a sleep textbook with an instructor. And um, we've been uh, uh, doing a lot of work on the images, like up to 140 images or more. And there was this one image that she was very interested in, which is, as you can see here, an example of um, how uh, sperm whales uh, sleep. Um, so uh, our student assistant um, found the image on Nat Geo. And um, by looking at the site, we had a general sense from the website um, and a phone message that they give you a phone, a phone number to call. The images could be used for educational purposes under the Fair Use Act. So we had a sense that these were available for fair use. But uh, the, the phone message did say, um, you know, if you want to confirm anything, please contact the US copyright website. So. We assumed, since there was no other information that we could find, that perhaps Nat Geo had um, um, copyrights. So we sent them an email. Fortunately, they promptly informed us to contact the photographer, who happened to be um, who's Stefan Granzotto, and he lives in Lyon, uh, France, um, which was an added interest point. Um, we tried reaching the photographer through his website, no response. Um, we also noticed he had a Facebook account and an Instagram account. Not exactly the way I would want to contact an author or a creator because there's only so much space and you don't want to get tangled up in a whole bunch of legal and you know discussion. Um, all I wanted was a response. So fortunately he responded to um, our Facebook um, uh, direct message. And um, very short phrase, yes, go ahead, use it. You know, it's like, wow, that was so exciting. But unfortunately, that was not enough information. <laughs> so it, it took a couple tries, but um, he, he gave us um, his email address. So now I'm contacting him to get a little bit more information and um, make sure that he understands um, all the terms that we're hoping um, for. When I first contacted him to DM, uh, we gave him the option of taking a look at the Creative Commons website and to consider, you know, um, releasing it, um, Creative Commons. But he, it seems like he went straight to the um, direct permissions option. So uh, got our fingers crossed. We're hoping that he's going to send us an image that's usable, uh, high quality enough for uh, the textbook that we're working on. So that's, that's about it. Uh, any questions or? I know we're running out of time, so I'll turn it back over to Carla. Hi, Karen, that reminds me. I forgot to ask if there was any questions about my part. We do have a few questions, and Will has also been addressing them um, this way <laughs> through writing. Um, but in terms of case studies, uh, John had a question about a high school choir performance. This is a real question that recently came up for him. If that performance included one or more copyrighted songs, does fair use allow them to post a recording of the performance on their website or Facebook page? Is this still considered educational use or do performance rights limit such use? It depends. And I think I wanna actually save this question for the end and come back to it because there's a couple different scenarios that we can work through here. Um, what is the copyright status of it? What are other exceptions available for the performance? And then what is a secondary consideration for posting it online? Um, so if we can save that one for the end, because we're going to step a little bit away from fair use within the context of OER, but fair use could come into play with some of the decisions that need to be made there. All righty. I'm not sure which of these remaining questions might be best addressed now or at the end of your presentation. So. Uh, maybe carry on and then we'll try to get through as many of these as possible. Okay, sounds great. Um, Sunny, thank you so much for sharing your experience. I think it's a fantastic example of all these options that are available to us as we are engaging with OER and these copyright issues. And um, Will is now going to take us a little bit into the context of fair use and building OER. Thank you, Carla. So, so this question, so if we're, if we're persuaded that fair use is interesting and important for all the reasons that we've talked about, and that it has something to say about education and publishing, the next question then is how does it fit with building OER? Um, and, and the first thing I want to say in this context is good news 
we're already relying on fair use, whether we realize it or not. I'm part of a team that's doing some interviews with stakeholders, and we have over and over had this two-step conversation where we say, so how do you think about fair use? And they'll say, oh, we never use fair use. It's too uncertain. We can't use it. And then, like in the next breath, they'll say, so this one time we had this short quotation that we, oh, did you get permission for that? No, no, no. That's just something you can do, right? That oftentimes when we say, oh, viscerally, that's just something you do, what we don't realize is that we're relying on fair use. So, so I, I, I think using fair use is less scary in part because we're already doing it and we're, we already have some sense viscerally about what feels appropriate and not, and we're going to dig into that a little bit more in a minute. Um, in addition to that, it's good that we're doing that fair use and relying on that fair use because commercial publishers are doing the same thing. And if we made the decision that fair use was too scary and uncertain, the main outcome from that would we would make it more likely that OER would be of lower quality than commercial resources. We would be fighting that fight sort of with one hand tied behind our back, as it were. So, so I don't think giving up on fair use is a sustainable way forward. And then the other piece of good news is it's not very hard, right? You do your fair use analysis, and then Creative Commons already has a clear way to mark third party content. So, so we're doing it, we need to keep doing it, and it's not too hard to do is sort of the first part of thinking about building OER. The next slide, though, is the one that keeps me up at night. It's, it's the reason that I'm really, really passionate about this issue, and it's that most people's lived experiences don't come with a CC BY license. I think fair use is absolutely critical to open educational practices, particularly those designed to do the things that Dave talked about earlier in the week, bringing in voices that aren't represented in the commons, um, and hashtag commons so white is a thing for a reason, um, and using fair use as a way to add new perspectives and talk back to dominant culture. That if we don't have fair use, we can't ask students to talk about the music that inspires them or the news events that are going on in front of them, right? It's, it's a bummer that we don't have any pictures of protests from any of the A states right now. And I commend Phoebe for doing this really important work of gathering it, but there's gonna be a next thing and a next thing, right? History happens again every morning. And if we have to wait until something moves into the commons, we really handicap OER as a, as a collaborative sort of textbook making enterprise, but even more than that, we limit to things that are openly licensed and things in the public domain, the kind of art we can make and conversations we have and education that we can do. So to me, fair use is, is the centerpiece of active open pedagogy and open educational practices writ large. So those are sort of the two reasons that I think it's necessary to think about fair use in terms of building open educational resources and developing and doing open educational practices. Carla, did you want to talk about downstream uses? Yes, please. So, of course, we have fair use within the context of creating OER. Um, but then there's also fair use within the context of those downstream uses. Um, whether we want to use something or it's people who are engaging with OER that we have created. And we already see some considerations for this as well. So first off, fair use runs underneath every Creative Commons license. If you go take a look at the license deed, what it talks about is that, um, you know, we have this license. And the great thing about the license is it provides those clear opportunities for how we can use works. But what it says is that if, you know, your use doesn't fall within the scope of the license here, you can still consider fair use. Um, as something, as an option for reusing the work the way you wish to. So we already kind of see that built into the Creative Commons licenses that support for applications of fair use. And then of course, we can also consider use in situations where other people have gotten permission or a license. Um, so for example, if Will has created an open educational resource, and I find something within that, um, whether it's a picture or a chart or a graph, um, that he has gotten permission or got a, a license for, just because he got permission or a license, it doesn't mean I absolutely have to get a permission or a license as well for the way I want to use it as a downstream user. I could consider fair use for my own use. So what somebody does isn't necessarily dictated by how somebody before them used a particular work. This is all a great and wonderful thing that fair use kind of runs under all these options, but it can lead to some confusion, as can fair use in general. Um, I think the number one concern I hear about fair use is it's so vague. Um, and the vagueness, I think, is actually some of the beauty of it. If fair use was much more specific, it would probably be much less harder for us to be able to use it or to be able to use it effectively. 
if fair use was purely limited to the classroom news reporting, then when we provide, wanted to provide criticism or commentary in some other capacity, we might then have to go get that permission, which we might not be granted, because probably not a lot of people will be pleased with the idea that somebody's going to provide criticism or commentary on what they created. I think I especially hear a lot of frustration about things being vague tied to the third factor of fair use. But again, if we had hard and fast limits, whether that's, you know, you can only use one chapter of a work, or you can only use five images, and that's all fair use is, well, if we need more, then we, we are confined by the boundaries of the law. So yes, it can be vague. We do have to interpret things, but the fact that it was created vague is what allows it to be so adaptable and so functional. And I think especially taking a look back at the um, statement of fair use in the time of COVID-19 um, that the copyright librarians and attorneys put together, the way fair use can be adapted to that situation as well to allow us to do things we might not otherwise have done to support online education. And then, of course, um, there's the concern that I am going to get sued. I totally understand that concern. It's something that is in the back of my mind for a variety of things that I'm doing, but not letting that drive what I do specifically. Um, or in those cases where we do see people sued, and one thing I will say is we don't see a lot of librarians and educators getting sued, but in those situations where they happen, um, so the information will shared about those fair use determinations that were found in favor of people thoughtfully using fair use and those protections provided in section 503c2 for us as well. Um, so there's some things that can kind of, you know, limit those concerns for us. And then another concern is communicating to those users downstream that my fair use is not necessarily your fair use, or that my permission is not necessarily your permission, that they need to make their own thoughtful applications of the law within the context of their reuse. However, we have some experience with this as well. Um, thinking about the rights statements that are out there that so many libraries and archives are starting to use for our collections, and what the rights statements do is talk a little bit about what is the copyright status of this work? Is it something we know that's protected by copyright? Is it an orphan work where we're a little bit uncertain maybe about its status or who owns the rights? Here is the context of how we are making it available to you. And here's some things you need to think about within the context of you reusing this. And I think a lot of um, what comes down to considering fair use for OER, and it is a consideration, um, is how do we make our own thoughtful determinations and then how do we communicate that information. And then also tied to communication is myth busting. Um, I was recently working with a faculty member on a publication and uh, they gave me this folder with tons and tons of pictures in it. And I was kind of like, Eek. and they're like, oh, I found them all on Google and I promised they're all Creative Commons. And anyway, it's an educational use, so it's all fair use anyway, you worry work, Carla. And we had to talk about this misconception that educational uses are automatically fair uses. But there is also the idea that commercial uses can never be fair uses. I was talking with somebody who said, well, you know, sometimes you'll see that the digital copy can be downloaded for free. And if you want to buy a print copy, you have to pay for that. Maybe it's at cost, but that makes it a commercial use. It doesn't necessarily make it a commercial use, maybe in the context of thinking about it. But what we see from a lot of court cases is just because there could be a commercial aspect of the project doesn't mean that fair use can be considered. Um, of course, these horrible, horrible amount considerations that if we're only reusing 30 seconds from a song or three minutes from a movie, that's automatically fair use. That if it's 10% or one chapter, that's automatically fair use. Or that these provide safe harbors. Um, these are not found in the law. We took a look at the fair use statute with Will. There was no set amounts or fixed percentages. Um, and that, that, that very incorrect belief that if we only use a small portion, um, that we are not going to get sued. Um, that fair use is a United States construct and that if we are making these openly available online, that international adoption of our OER cannot be considered. That is not true either. Um, but if the rights holder has a license available, it can't be fair use. We have to pay for it if it's something that we can license. Or that if we've talked to somebody and they denied us a permission or the license was so excessive that um, 
whether it was the scope of the license, the terms, or the amount that we can't then consider fair use. We have seen from court cases that is not the case. Um, and then, you know, the idea we can't know for certain. So in the end, the only thing that fair use allows us to do is hire a lawyer and that's going to be expensive. In the end, fair use will be determined by a judge or a jury. But there is so much case law out there tied to fair use and especially fair use within an educational context that I think we can learn from those to help build up some comfort in the thoughtful applications that we are making. There are some red flags as well, though, that I want to share with Will. I'll have Will share. Will, you're still muted. Unmute. Thank you, ma'am. I think I can do this in one minute, so set your watches and go. Carla did a great job of talking about the sort of imagine the areas of imagined concern, like the, where, the, where the anxiety probably outstrips the risk. There are some areas where there there are real caution flags, uh, particularly uses that act as a substitute for the original, right? Building textbooks from all rights reserved textbooks and uses that are decorative or clearly disproportionate, right? Using an ornamental cover image in the way that Carla talked about. Next slide, please. Um, so, so the theme we've, we've continued to sound is this sense of uncertainty, that what I really need is for somebody to tell me what's good practice or what we can do, and that's where a best practices document can step up. Next slide, please. You, if you're familiar with these, you know, and if not, I suggest that you check out. There's this whole suite of best practices in fair use for documentary filmmakers and academic librarians. Um, the, the book we mentioned earlier about Picasso relied on one of these. Um, if you do e-reserves in your library, I hope you rely on the best practices for fair use in academic libraries. So there's a great set of those. Next slide, please. And we're currently developing a set of best practices for fair use in OER and OEP. Uh, normally that's done by meeting with large groups of people all across the country in small rooms for long conversations. We're not doing that right now because the world's on fire. Um, so instead, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, we're, we're talking about doing that online and we've been doing a series of webinars that I, I suggest you check out as well. A lot of the myth busting things that Carla mentioned quickly, um, the, the how, does fair, how do fair dealing, dealing and fair use connect? We address that in there. How do we use open licenses to create anti-racist materials? A lot of the things that we're thinking about and that fair use enables exist there. Um, I'm happy to talk more about that in the future, but we've got two minutes left. I wanna give one of those to Carla to close it out and then hopefully do a question or two. Thanks for your patience. To go through this quickly, how does this all come together? Um, what do we hope, or at least what do I hope that you take away? Um, it's all about options when it comes to creating OER. Of course, we can create our own content. We can use public domain books. We can use openly licensed works. Fair use is another option that fits within the scope of this, as is obtaining a permission or obtaining a license for your use. And how you work through these options might be based on the resources you have, whether that's staffing, um, whether it's financial considerations, it might be tied to the, um, uh, the, the considerations for risk that your institution is comfortable with. Maybe they're maybe very conservative when it comes to legal risk. Maybe they're a little bit more open to that legal risk. We have all of these options. And I think Sunny's example is a really great illustration of, they talked about how this can be fair use within the educational context, but then there was this underlying permission as well to make sure everything was clear and good. So you might find yourself touring through all of these. And something that we can kind of take away is how we work through these and where we have seen support, not only within the courts for applications, but the best practice documents. What I love about the best practice documents, what I'm so excited about what Will is putting together is this is consensus thought about we as, how we as librarians and educators and authors of open educational resources view these different considerations. Which will you choose? Whatever you choose, make thoughtful determinations, work with other your others at your institution, and remember our mission, um, which is to educate and help provide the best educational resources as possible. Um, so now we have time for questions. Thank you so much. <laughs> we do not have time for questions, sadly. Um, you guys have shared such great content and there are many questions, um, you know, particular to types of content, um, that I know we can continue this conversation perhaps on Twitter or if you're a member of the OTN in our Google group and we will hold more sessions like this. Um, we know that you have a lot of questions about fair use and uh, we're here for you as you try to answer them. So please join me in thanking Sunny, Carla and Will very much for their time and thank all of you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Farewell. Thanks everybody. Thanks, everyone.